Cowichan River and Cowichan Lake were first surveyed by British engineers in 1858. They found towering forests of fir, cedar, and hemlock. They also found a river that was a fly fisher's dream. In 1886, a dirt road opened up the area to settlement. It also made it easier for wealthy adventurers to get into the area for the excellent hunting and fishing. During this time, the Riverside Hotel was built where the river flows out of the lake. It was a primitive affair, but the outdoorsmen were coming to tap into their primitive nature. The Lakeside Hotel opened in 1893, boasting the first pub in the area. This was a popular spot where a hardy sportsman could get a beverage after a day of adventure in the wilds of the Cowichan Valley. Cowichan Lake and River were becoming famous among the fishing fraternity, and a trip to Vancouver Island wasn't complete without a journey to the area. Articles were appearing in newspapers as far away as London, England. The early European settlers came to farm, but it was soon evident that there was much more money to be made in the forest. The problem was getting the logs out to the coast where the mills were. The original road was too narrow to haul the huge timbers, so the first timber logged in the couch and lake area was floated down the river. It was a dangerous and tricky operation. The river's water levels were only high enough from late fall to late spring each year, and even then, log jams were a problem. Because of these obstacles, many logs were lost and the big dreams of the logging companies stalled. Life in the small village at the head of the river remained slow-paced and serendipitous. In 1910, a fish hatchery was constructed on the river just below the lake. Built to enhance native fish stocks and introduce new species, it was the first hatchery in North America devoted to a sports fishery. The tourists had money to spend, and the more fish in the river, the better. The facility was hatching and stocking the river with steelhead, salmon species, and trout. The hatchery was also experimenting with non-indigenous species for the sole purpose of attracting more sports fishermen. Atlantic salmon were hatched and introduced into the system, but despite repeated efforts, they did not survive. Eastern brown trout, the fly fisherman's favorite, were introduced in 1932, and within the first few years they were spawning in the river. On June 18, 1918, something happened that would change life in the quiet village forever. The first train from Victoria arrived at Cowichan Lake. Like most of the rail lines in BC, the tracks to the bank of the Cowichan Lake were built at great expense for one main purpose, to transport logs and lumber. The forest industry was evolving from hand logging and hauling with oxen to a mechanized efficient industry. The forests around Cowich and Lake were relatively untouched. Virgin stands of timber in the forest companies saw profits that were there for the taking. Mills sprang up on the lake, men came for the work, and the small village boomed. In 1947, Ron and Rose Cecil moved to the banks of the Cowichan River. They shared a passion for the outdoors, and the Cowichan Valley had it all. Hunting and fishing as well as an escape from the emerging chaos of Vancouver. It was a dramatic change for the Cecils. Ron left a job selling fine china in a Vancouver department store to work in the sawmill at Honeymoon Bay on Cowichan Lake. When Ron and I moved here in 47, it was very hard. And um, 
We had a very small house on the river. I used to have to go out and get wood in the morning. Sometimes the wood would be wet, trying to get a fire going. It was awful. What I hated most of all was trying to light the lamp at night before Ron came home, pumping that gas lamp up. It would make a noise. I'd be scared I might blow up. <laughs> oh. And, and, then, then, and then having children. And it then... Still, it was still probably pretty... And then when Joe was born, I still had no electricity, no... Well, we had a little tin heater in the front room and a wood stove in the kitchen. Joe Cecil was born in 1947. And from the time he was big enough to hold a rod, he was fishing on the river just beyond his back door. As Joe grew older, he was becoming an expert fisherman. He spent countless hours on the couch and learning about nature in an outdoor classroom that was a youngster's paradise. Over the years, his father earned a solid reputation as a guide, taking visitors out on the river. It was a natural progression for Joe to follow in his dad's footsteps, guiding on the river he loved. I got my first boat when I was 12, and uh, I'd go out with my dad if he had too many, and uh, I'd follow him with his boat and my boat. Guiding is only seasonal work, and the money isn't that good. So like his dad, well, like say, when Joe got out of high school, he went to work in the forest industry. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Joe worked in the woods most of the year. Then in the late fall and winter, when the salmon and steelhead returned, he would work as a guide. When his dad retired from the guiding business, Joe became one of the top guides on the Cowichan. Driven by his lifelong bond with the river, Joe was also active in various fish and game clubs and groups in the 1970s and began to lobby government to have the Cowichan River corridor preserved as park. Back in the early 70s, David Anderson and I used to drift and fish and everything. And we understood that, you know, sooner or later, even though that's not a desirable side to build on, that it would get de developed. And there was only one way to combat that, and that was to try and make some parks out of it. So, it just kind of started as an idea of discussing it and saying, you know, a couple of us saying, hey, what do you think? This river used to have the highest Chinook concentration on the east coast of Vancouver Island. And roughly around 8,000 Chinooks, and today we're lucky if we've got 1,000, but it is, you know, uh, Whereas Coho were about, it used to be about 40,000, and I don't know what it is today, but it's probably there's a big brown trout in there today. Cohoes were, were roughly around 40,000 one time, and now they've gone right downhill to about, um, be lucky, I think, if we got 10,000 in the river now. That's a habitat problem, that's a commercial fishery problem, it's everything whole ball of wax. See, there's a habitat problem. See that bank right there? See how all the willows are gone? Mow it right down like that to the edge. Yeah. And that was all willows at one time. And now they've been cut down. Now the fry, salmon fry, they need willows and grass and cover along the edge. They're not going to get it there because there's nothing there to hold them. Those, the willows are the most one of the most important things of the whole river. You've it's got to leave a riparian zone along the river. People say, well, I'll just cut down one little section for me. But what they forget is that if everybody does that before too long, everybody's got it cut down and then you don't have the habitat anymore. Yeah, with the log and they take out the big trees and then it rains and then we get tremendous runoff. So the, the runoff cuts the banks all up because there's no protection from the roots for long. That whole bank's changed. And that bank is now in the river, which creates gravel bars downstream, which silts in the reds and changes the course of the river and everything else. Plus, they need those trees 
in this warmer weather for shade, keep the river cool. Joe was a faller. Falling is one of the most dangerous occupations in the world. In 1991, a serious accident very nearly cost Joe his life. Six months later, after a remarkable recovery from a broken C7 vertebrae in his neck and a broken arm and leg, Joe returns to work. But something had changed. After a few years of fighting the company and the union, he could no longer bring himself to be part of an industry that was doing so much damage to the environment. After two days back on the job, Joe quits. After 20 years in the bush, he walks away from his job and his security. Sooner or later, people are going to realize that the environment is the number one thing. Without an environment, you have nothing. People keep saying about jobs and money and this and that. If you don't have an environment, you have nothing. You won't have a job because there'll be nothing because you'll die too. So the environment is the most important thing of all. <laughs> 